Well hello and welcome back to Dunking. Now something that seems poorly understood and is very highly criticized is the Orion-Giza correlation. Basically that's the hypothesis that the three pyramids on Giza's plateau, the three big boys, they were built to emulate the three stars in Orion's belt. Now this has been met with a lot of criticism and is generally mocked by people that are more skeptical of these kinds of things. In this video we will be evaluating the evidence for it scientifically. We're not going to be looking at any of the conjecture or any of that stuff. We're going to be looking at archaeological evidence, anthropological evidence, astronomical evidence, and the mathematics behind it that bears this out or does not as the case may be. We won't be really looking at the dates of this. There's a lot of them posited and there are some papers that have been published since then. As a matter of fact it's one thing I want to discuss right out the gate is the sources that I choose here are going to be far more robust than I might otherwise do just because of how frequently this stuff is picked at. So as far as archaeoastronomy papers themselves go, ones discussing directly this correlation, I'm going to be basically citing one man's work specifically because he wants nothing to do with the 10,500 BC, he wants nothing to do with Atlantis, he is actively looking for a date that correlates exactly with the archaeological timeline. So. As far as that goes, he should be someone that the archaeological community does not find nearly as problematic as a man like Robert Vival. His name is Vincenzo Orofino, I think. He's Italian, like a lot of other archaeoastronomers. And I'm horrible with Italian names, so sorry. So he's an astrophysicist, and he frequently dips his toes into the archaeoastronomical community. So he will be the person that I cite the most when, when discussing the actual archaeoastronomy at Giza. I'm also going to be using accepted knowledge when it comes to Egyptian religious beliefs of the time and Egyptian archaeological stuff. There won't be any conjecture or speculative stuff as far as that goes. Everything is going to be either completely accepted or accepted as one of the viable hypotheses, not something that's hotly contested. I don't want any loose threads to be pulled out here as far as that goes because right out the gate I'm going to hear how a tic-tac-toe board, for example, will give the same correlation as the Giza pyramids. So, Due to that kind of skepticism out the gate, I am going to steel man this as much as possible before we get started. Making their job harder or easier as the case may be, however you want to look at it. And one more thing before we get going, since I am a lay person and I'm going to be building a semi-scientific case here as much as a lay person can, right? We're all pseudoscientists, right? I'm going to be citing other people like heavily. I, I, I'm not going to make you rely on me very much. There'll be a couple of times that I'll be like, dude, the Egyptians put scarabs on their mummies. You don't believe me, go look it up. But for the most part, I'm going to back up what I have to say with, with as, as much uh, academic evidence as possible. So you don't have to trust an electrician. You can trust the electrician gathering you academic information. If that makes sense. First thing to discuss would be the creation myths of the ancient Egyptians and how that ties into their concept of afterlife and immortality. Um, we have the story of Adam rising from the primordial waters upon the Ben-Ben stone and that gets kind of twisted up into Adam being the Ben-Ben stone and the Ben-Ben stone becoming like the top of the pyramids. The pyramids themselves meant to represent the Ben-Ben stone in shape and the outcrop of rock in the bottom of each pyramid, which I've discussed in my previous video on the Giza pyramids, but basically there's a, it's a, in the foundation when they would level the ground, they would leave a huge chunk of bedrock in the middle of it. And one of the hypotheses is that is there to emulate that Ben Ben stone, that primeval mound, that first water, that first mound that came through the Nile flood waters on the time of creation that Adam sat upon. Allow me to read from somebody much smarter than me. In the beginning, the universe consisted of an undifferentiated watery substance called Nun, the primeval waters, often personified as a god. In these waters, and to a certain extent identical with them, is Adam, the creator god, whose name probably means he who makes complete finisher. Adam floats in the primeval waters in an echoic state, and he who is in an egg, and his creation begins with the differentiation of the seed of undeveloped matter from the primeval water surrounding it. To visualize this beginning of creation, the Egyptians often used the mythical image of a primeval mound emerging from the waters, an image that was familiar to them from the annual recession of the waters of the Nile at the end of the inundation season. This primeval mound, which in the Heliopolis version of the creation myth is identical to the sacred precinct of the temple of Heliopolis, is in the same time a manifestation of Adam himself and the place where Adam begins to create or develop himself. 
This process of self-generation brings about the gradual unfolding of undifferentiated unity into the differentiated diversity of the world as we know it, the elements of nature, the complementaries of life, and social institutions. As I said, Adam is often directly equated with the primordial mound. Allow me to read from the pyramid texts themselves. Utterance 600, to say, O Adam Kefri, when thou didst mount as a hill, and didst shine as the Ben-Ben, in the temple of the phoenix in Heliopolis. And as we progress, you'll notice that there's a lot of that sympathetic magic kind of thinking in their speech here, like that, where it's not just, they, they superimpose the idea of the things sharing a attribute into them being one another. And this was pretty common in Egypt for those of you who are aware, like the, they would even embody the uh, uh, dung beetle as like being raw or whatever, rolling the sun across the ground. It was kind of a weird thing in their head. Anyway, as we continue, we'll see a little bit more of the sympathetic magic kind of embodiment of one thing having the property of another, therefore actually being considered the other in a weird sort of way. Like Adam not just rising out on the Ben Ben stone, but actually being part of the Ben Ben stone or part of the Bennu bird, which I would point out is usually equated with the phoenix, which is a symbol of rebirth, which would tie in very well with the entire idea we're going at here with the pyramids. Now, another big part of Egyptian belief in afterlife was Osiris and the myth of Osiris and Set. Let me read a real quick synopsis here. In order to release the deceased king from death and earth, he had to be separated from his own death. This mythical model for this operation was the myth of Osiris. Osiris, a god and a king of Egypt, had been killed by his brother and rival Seth, who, moreover, tore his body apart and scattered his limbs all over Egypt. Isis, the sister and wife of Osiris, traverses Egypt in search of the member Dissectia of her brother, reassembling them into the shape of a body. Together with her sister Nephethys, she bewails the body in long songs of lamentation using the power of speech as a means of reanimation. Isis and Nephethys were so successful in their reanimating recitations that Isis was able to receive a child from the reanimated body of Osiris. This is the first step towards resurrection. So Osiris is heavily correlated with the Egyptian idea of resurrection and rebirth. Osiris is also correlated heavily with the constellation of Orion. From a pyramid text in 2287 BC, Behold, he has come as Orion. Osiris has come as Orion, lord of the wine of the Wag Festival. Do not ask what Wag Festival means. And in the book Osiris, Death and Afterlife of a God, when they list the short little synopsis of each god, Osiris has this said about him, related with the constellation of Orion. Now, Osiris was said to take a sky boat through what's called the Dua, and that's a kind of a confusing idea, which we'll, again, we'll get into the dualism of Egyptian ideals here in a little bit, but the Dua is, um, in the sky, is the region of sky, basically, that is that little bit of before dawn, when the sun has started to creep up to the sky, and there's that little bit of, of sunlight creeping up, so you get a little pink sky, or a little bit of orange sky, or whatever you can start to see, but you can still see the stars. Now, what's interesting to me about this, as an aside, is that this is a very important time of day astronomically. Um, this is when you can see what star rises into what constellation. You can tell what, what the sun is housed in during this time of day and only during this time of day. So the fact that this time of day was important to them does tell me that they were probably pretty keen astronomers even before archaeology wants to give them credit for that. But that's an aside. And so when an Egyptian died, they were said to have to travel through the Duat to be judged by Osiris. When an Egyptian died, not just the Pharaoh, they had to follow the same path as the sun. At the end of that journey, Osiris sat in judgment. And while that spoke of them traveling through the path of the sun, we'll read a little bit more here. The notion of Duat is a major component of the ancient Egyptian afterlife belief system as it refers to the realm of the dead. Yet scholars do not agree on a proper definition of what the Egyptians meant as Duat. The term is mostly translated as underworld or netherworld, but a portrayal of the dua as such is found only in the funerary compositions preserved in the New Kingdom royal tombs. The creation of a chthonic netherworld, in fact, represents the culmination in the evolution of the concept, reached after thousands of years of development, and is therefore not necessarily applicable to older periods. Even during the New Kingdom, it is only one of the multiple scenarios encountered when analyzing funerary documents and depictions of the afterlife. In fact, on the one hand, the underworld books primarily portray the Duat as a subterranean region. On the other, the books of the sky present it as a regenerating, hidden space within the nut. Complementarity of many notions intertwined in the conceptualization of the Duat is the reason why a single delineation of it cannot be achieved without having to sacrifice a plethora of meanings and layers of tradition nested within one another. Now by nut, it doesn't mean like 
that was hidden in somebody's nuts. It, nut Nut was the Egyptian word for the goddess that made up the sky. So there, there's your big joke this episode, lo, lo, lo. So the important takeaway for me here is the duwa is dualistic. It not only is sky and ground it, to, to the point that they can't separate it. And this is something that we're going to continue to see as kind of a pattern here and there. As a matter of fact, if I may, when the world came into being, there were two rivers, the river of Egypt and the river of the sky. Great is the Nile, the river of Egypt, rising in its two caverns in the south beyond the cataract, flooding the land of Egypt and bringing joy and good harvest to the Tamari. Great and mighty is the river of the sky, flowing across the heavens and through the Duat, the world of night and thick darkness, and on that river floats the boat of Ra, boat of millions of years in its name, but men call it the Manzet boat, and the dawn when Ra rises in splendor on the eastern horizons in the heaven. The Mesket boat it is called in the evening, when Ra enters in glory in the portals of the Duat, when the mountains of Manu lifts its peak to the western sky. So to recap the anthropological, archaeological, mythological side of this whole thing really quickly, um, Orion, Osiris, is equated with afterlife, with the sun, with rebirth, as is pyramids, which is incorporated in the pyramids in kind of a trifecta of a primordial mound in the base, a primordial mound in the top, and in the shape of the pyramid itself. Um, the god uh, Adam was part of the original primordial mound, not just sitting on the thing but considered part of the thing and also considered part of the ben ben stone or the benu bird which is the phoenix again a symbol of rebirth and death we have a system of incorporated symbology that overlaps with each other that i generally call sympathetic magic and i'm not alone there and i pointed out two places where the sky ground dualism is important and one would be the duod itself being both underworld and upper world and the other would be the nile and the milky way one being the river of the sky and the other being the nile this will kind of form the basis of my hypothesis here as we move forward on egyptian mythology and how it will apply to the orion correlation all right, now let's get into the astronomical side of this. First of all, the alignment. The alignment has been looked at pretty carefully by more than one archaeoastronomer. And allow me to read from a paper from Mr. Orofino, who I mentioned before I'll be citing heavily because he's not an Atlantis hunter or a pyramid idiot or any of that stuff. He's very much trying to find a date that lines up with archaeology and lines up with mythology. He's trying to do it properly. In the present paper, the Orion correlation theory has been subjected to some quantitative astronomical and astrophysical verifications in order to assess its compatibility with the results of both naked eye astrometry and photometry. In particular, a linear correlation is found between the height of such monuments and the present brightness of the Orion belt stars. According to these analyses, it is possible to conclude that the Orion correlation theory is not incompatible with what is expected for the stars of Orion belt on the basis of naked eye astronomy and photometry, as well as the stellar evolution theory. So he shows this figure here, and then he has this to say. This figure shows that a certain discrepancy exists between the actual position of the vertex of each pyramid and the position expected on the basis of stellar correlation. Such a difference is more pronounced in the case of the couple of Khufu al Natak, where it is equal to 3.1% of the angular distance between al Tanak and al Inamam. Since the angular separation of the two stars is 1.356 degrees, this corresponds to about 2.5 arc minutes. This value is less than the resolution power of the human eye, defined by the minimum angular distance between two sources necessary to see them as distance objects. The latter generally falls between 5 and 10 arc minutes, according to the characteristics of the observed sources, and in most favorable cases can be as low as 3. And he also points out that you have to invert the stars in Orion's belt to make them match the pyramids, and this is something that's been pointed out since day one of Baval bringing this out. But it does, in my opinion, neglect to pay attention to the fact that the sky ground dualism thing was a very big deal. So it's kind of like a mirror image thing, like you see with the Sphinx cartouche here. It, it was one copy and the other like a mirror. So it makes sense that one would be opposite from the other. He doesn't say that, I'm saying that. He then discusses the correlation between the magnitude or the apparent brightness of each star from Earth and the size of each of the pyramids. There's a chart. If I may, straight line of linear regression between the apparent height of the pyramids and the visual magnitude of the corresponding stars of the Orion belt. The error bar is due to the typical uncertainty of evaluation by the naked eye. The linear anticorrelation between H and M implies a linear correlation of H and the apparent brightness of the Orion stellars. That is a linear grow of the latter with apparent height of the corresponding pyramids. 
A plot of the visual magnitude M of the Orion Belt stars versus the apparent height H of the corresponding pyramids with respect to the base level of the Khufu pyramid shows a significant anti-correlation between the two quantities. Such an anti-correlation means that equal increases in H correspond to equal decreases in M and therefore to equal increments in the apparent brightness of the stars. The ancient Egyptian well knew of this kind of geometrical mathematical relationship that they used many times when, for example, they planned and carried out architectural structures with a constant slope where equal horizontal displacements correspond to equal vertical displacements, such as the same pyramids and the shafts and corridors inside of them. And he offers more evidence in this and another paper, and I will link them both down below, of course. But the point is here is that it is not just the layout of the pyramids, but the magnitude of well that shows a correlation. And those two together becomes considerably more compelling, I think, than a straight line of, of big rocks, right? And then we get to the math side of this, which he uses to bear it out, which just really quickly I'll go through his findings. And again, the links are down below so you can go through and work this out for yourself. But this just gets boring for everybody if we go too much into the equations. Discussing the magnitude correlation, it is worthwhile to note the correlation coefficient associated to the data shown in figure 5 is equal to 0.9993. And in this principle, this value would imply a probability of about only 3% or less than the anti-correlation between H and M could be due to sheer chance. And then discussing the location of the pyramids, four selection cuts have been applied to the three pyramid configuration to estimate the percentage of those compatible with Orion Belt. The cuts are reported in Table 2 with two possible results. Each probability is the result of associated cut in the previous ones. The probability errors are negligible because the simulated sample is very large. In both cases, the final probability is very low. The more conservative probability is about 0.018%. So mathematically, either one of these correlations is pretty anomalous on its own. Together, I would posit that is extremely mathematically anomalous. Now, one thing to point out here is there's two papers that I've talked about a little bit here that was penned by the same man, and, and he was in competition with somebody else. That's why the second paper was wrote, because th these guys posited that Cygnus, the wings of Cygnus, are the stars that Orion's belt, <laughs> excuse me, are the stars that Giza was meant to line up with. And they actually posited that perhaps it was also intended to uh, line up with Orion as well, and they had more of a three-dimensional thing. And his second paper was firing back against that. And I mentioned this, again, those other guys are not pyramid idiots either. I'll put their paper down below and you can look and see none of the people here are Atlantis hunters and they're all accepting the correlation because as archaeoastronomers they take a look at it and it is compelling to them. As I mentioned at the beginning and passing, you're talking about we have scarabs and Eye of Horus and other little things that were used as funerary rites that they would put on Egyptian bodies in order to help them cheat in the afterlife, protect them, guide them, help them not have their heart weigh more than a feather and all this kind of stuff. It's not unimaginable to think of the Pharaoh trying to attract that same thing with, we are building Orion, we are building Osiris here on the ground. When we go to the Duat to meet Osiris, we will come in a manner that will be respectful, resplendent. However, it, you want to look at it, it's definitely attached as far as I could see, the same as they attach the Nile and the Milky Way. Anyway, I, I could start going off a little bit more, but I think I've done a pretty decent job of showing how this isn't just something that archaeoastronomers look at and is compelling. If you look at the mythology and of Egyptian practices, you could see that this actually would all tie in pretty well together and makes a lot of sense based on what we know about Egyptology and about their religion. Anyway, I hope this gets you to like look at this with a new set of eyes if you're one of the more skeptical people and if you're one of the people who's always like wondered what this was all about, I hope this gives you a little bit more of an idea. Uh, really quickly, you could never see the tops of the three dots of the light of the stars. They were never cresting at the top of the pyramids. That's something that you see in artistic renditions, but that was never it. It's more of a map on the ground, a copy of what was above. The Nile and the Milky Way and the pyramids and the stars, just for, to alleviate any confusion there. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Um, if you want to see me cover the little fight those guys had about the Cygnus and thing, um, Cygnus and Orion correlation, let me know. Um, if you want to see more videos like this, let me know. If you hate this video and want me to make more videos picking on people, let me know. Um, if you didn't let your grandma know about me, you definitely need to let me know. Thanks a lot. Don't forget to click the like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.